Hi, I'm Trey Rogers. I'm the Briggs and Stratton Yard Doctor. And today we're talking weeds. I have my good friend and colleague, Ron Calhoun, with me here today, who is also known as the Weed Whisperer. And this is a great time of year to talk about weeds, Ron. It's a, it's a great time of year. Uh, you know, uh, to get out in the springtime and start seeing all the weeds that are growing in the yard uh, is exciting for someone that's a weed geek like me. Today we're going to talk about how to battle weeds. And really, you got to know your enemy. You got to know what you're battling, mm -hmm. when the time of year to battle it. Absolutely. And then eventually, what is going to be your weapon to take this dude out? So that's a weed. I thought maybe you had like a bouquet thing here. No, this there, is a weed. So. This is actually bull thistle, and I do agree. It looks like a bouquet. I wouldn't <laughs> touch it if I were you. Well, that was fun. I went out and pulled out uh, a dandelion, and uh, it is impressive to see uh, the root system that's on these weeds. To think about a lot of times, we just sort of concentrate on the top and to look and see how much is growing underneath. Uh, really gives you an idea of uh, how difficult that battle can be. Well, the thing that you have to be interesting that's interesting about this battle that we're talking about against weeds is we can show you how to take a weed out. We can take care of weeds, but it's going to be keeping those weeds out that's going to be very important. So while we're going to show you today how to identify and take the weeds out, we don't want you to forget that the most important thing for keeping the weeds out is effectively mowing watering and fertilizing your lawn. So the three legs of that stool are very, very important because we'll take them out, but how you manage your yard with mowing, watering, and fertilizing is gonna be how you keep the weeds out. First we wanna know, you know, you see a plant, how do you know what, what is a weed in your lawn? And really the great thing about it is you get to decide uh, what you want your lawn to look like. And so if you're okay with a little bit of clover, you're okay with a little bit of, of dandelion, then, then that's fine. Uh, there is no botanical description for the term weed. And so you get to be the ultimate arbiter of what's a weed, what you want in your lawn, and what you don't. A lot of times people notice weeds in their lawn when they're flowering. And so in the springtime is when we have a lot of enthusiasm to get in our lawns and we, and we want to get after it. And, uh, and so I think identifying the weed and understanding that certain weeds in the springtime are finishing their life cycle. So we're gonna talk about life cycles and the types of weeds today. Uh, we're gonna come back and, and touch on the maintenance practices that we do to the lawn. And then we're also gonna talk about some herbicide options. I got a little goodie bag over here that we can talk about. When is the best time to use those herbicides? Absolutely. Because that's a big key as well. Because if I have this creeping Charlie in my hand, for example, there are just a couple of times a year when I can really take it out. One is at the end of May and the other one's in September. I waste a lot of money during the summer trying to take Creeping Charlie out. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the dandelion rod. Absolutely. Yeah, you try, to, you try to control this guy in the springtime when you have all that energy reserve in the soil, and it's gonna be really hard to take that out. If you've got any questions that you'd like to, call, to get to us, we want you to email or call us at 1-866-YARD-TIPS or email us at yardsmarts.com and we'll take your questions while we're doing this, so, while we're doing this show. Oh, that'd be fantastic. Questions about weeds make me tingle. One of the things we want to cover today are the different types of weeds that you're going to run into. Now we can divide them into annuals and perennials, where the annual is going to complete its life cycle during one particular growing season, and perennial is going to come back year after year, just like the plants that might be in your garden. Ron, um, what are the, there are a couple of other differences that we have Grassy weeds and broadleaf weeds, what are the differences? Yeah. So when you think of broadleaf weeds, probably everyone thinks of dandelion. Uh, there couldn't be a better archetype for broadleaf weed than dandelion. It does happen to be a perennial. Um, so if we think about uh, something that comes back every year and has an ability to withstand mowing and that sort of thing. So dandelion would be a good example of a broadleaf perennial. Uh, clover, broadleaf plantain, all right? Then you have the annuals, uh, and the most famous annual will probably be crabgrass, which is a grassy weed. And again, as you mentioned, it completes its life cycle in one season. He's fascinating, isn't he? <laughs> he no one knows more than the weed whisperer. Now, the other thing that you're going to want to learn is about herbicides. Which ones to use when? Yep. Because when you go to the store, you can just be inundated with all of the different ones. And we want to break that down for you very simply. Okay, now let's actually talk about some specific herbicides. Ron, let's put the weeds down okay, for a second. Great. And let's move over here to your goodie bag. I notice you have a plethora 
of herbicides. Yeah. A third thing I want to cover, Ron, today is the idea of selective versus non-selective herbicides. Absolutely. Because That's probably the most uh, uh, famous example is Roundup, which has the active ingredient glyphosate. Right. And that'll actually not only kill the top part of the plant, but the herbicide will move into the root system as well. But this is going to kill everything that's green. All right. So when you think of these products that have glyphosate in them, they'll kill uh, broadleaf weeds, they'll kill grasses, they work along your fence line, uh, along the sidewalk. This and, is if, and if they touch your azaleas, they're going to kill those Abs as well. Absolutely. So you have to be very careful. These are things that you want to use in your sidewalks, mm -hmm. in your driveway, in areas where you want to kill something green but it's not your grass because it will kill the grass. And so this brings us to probably the most important thing that you can do when you're using a herbicide and that is to read the label. Read the label prior to using the herbicide because this label is going to tell you everything that you want to know. Absolutely. It's going to tell you is this a, is this a selective or a non-selective herbicide. You can always, if you're a little bit confused after you read the label, go to yardsmarts.com. Mm -hmm. We've described every herbicide in detail there so you can know exactly what this chemical is going to do. So the label is the most important thing to read. The second most important thing is to protect yourself when you're getting ready to go out and apply the herbicides. Put the gloves on. If it requires that you put on any type of protective covering, put that on as well. Because obviously that is a very important thing. You know, uh, just as an example, Trey, here's one where we have uh, glyphosate plus a product called triclopyr, uh, which is actually an excellent broadleaf weed killer. And so you might say, well, why would you put a non-selective with something else? Well, triclopyr has uh, an amazing uh, activity to kill things like uh, poison oak and poison ivy. And actually, they've branded that this way and made it very clear. So some of the way that they've done the labeling will help you make some of those selections. Uh, and again, it's another product, but specifically for a purpose of those woody, viney plants that you might have around the periphery of your lawn. Now, earlier, you got to a point where, well, first of all, let, let me cover selective herbicides. Okay? Right. And you just mentioned one with triclopyr. And the selective herbicide simply means that we can select a weed out of our grasses. And so basically we're going to be able to control a weed without necessarily killing the preferred species, which in this case is our turf grasses. And I'd have to say over the last few years they've made a lot of these things very simple by putting a mix of different products together that give us a broad spectrum, meaning it kills a lot of different weeds. And uh, so a product like this that actually has four active ingredients in it. They've actually made this so simple, I was actually worried about your job as whether or not you were going to have no. anything left to do. <laughs> so well, It's only my good looks that keeps me going. That's right. But now we've got to a point where we've got a, a three-way combination herbicide, right. which is 2,4-D plus Mecoprop plus Dicamba. Combine that with something called Quinclorac, and now it's almost a one-stop shop where you can get the majority of the broadleaf weeds and even now get grassy weeds on a post-emergent basis. Yeah, the but, nice thing about the marketing <clears throat> of a product like this is it's going to work on your broadleaf weeds in the springtime. And then when we talk about the annual grasses, if you end up having things like crabgrass come in, because of the quinclorac that they've put in there, it'll post-emergence take out the, the crabgrass in the summertime. Now you've brought up a couple of terms that we haven't covered yet, and I want to make sure that we do, and that is the difference between pre-emergence and post-emergence of weeds, because you'll hear those terms used mm -hmm. a lot. And when we talk about pre-emergence, what we're trying to do now is put a herbicide down before the actual weed emerges. And our best example of that is crabgrass. We always want people to put down uh, pre-emergence for crabgrass. And then the other example is post-emergence, and that means the weed is already up and growing, and we control it after that on a post-emergent basis. So we have those two different types of herbicides, and you need to know the difference there. And Talk a little bit about the pre-emergent herbicide, Ron. What's so, going on? Uh, since crabgrass has to come back from seed every year, uh, we need conditions in the soil and in the environment that are going to allow that crabgrass to germinate, which means it goes from a seed to, to a plant. So in the springtime, we'll go out, we'll be looking at soil temperatures, and we see today we're somewhere in the mid-50s with our soil temperatures. And uh, that tells us that uh, it's probably uh, still in the window where we could apply a pre-emergent herbicide because we want that barrier to be in place 
before uh, the moisture and the soil temperature is conducive to get the crabgrass to germinate. And so we're, we're probably at the end of that window right now, but the mid-50s is a good kind of a, a litmus test for getting out and doing that. And so that, that little plant is going to grow into that pre-emergence barrier, and that's what's going to stop it. And so that pre-emergence needs to be before it emerges, pre-emergence. Right. Once you see it is when we switch over to the post-emergence. And the pre-emergence herbicide is not going to have any effect on any weed that's already up and growing. That's right. And so that's what oftentimes what people get confused by is they'll go out and they'll put down their pre-emergence herbicide and then they'll be frustrated that nobody, that their weeds aren't controlled and you really weren't, that wasn't your target. Now, Ron, oftentimes early in the year, right. We will see people get, we'll get lots of phone calls from people that they'll say, I put down my pre-emergent herbicide and I've still got crabgrass, mm -hmm. or I've got crabgrass growing right now in, in early May. Is that possible? Well, what, what you're seeing there, and this happens every year, we had some of these calls in the last couple of weeks, is uh, people are going to call and they're going to say, my pre-emergence barrier isn't working because you see a wide-leafed, off-colored grass growing in your, in your yard, usually in a patch or a clump. And uh, about 99 times out of 100, that's going to be a patch of tall fescue, not a turf-type tall fescue, but sort of a wild-type tall fescue. Could even be orchard grass. It could be orchard grass. It could also be a little bit of quack grass. Quack grass, because right. Because those grasses will get growing sooner in the spring than some of your long grasses. And you just assume, because it's something that's not the grass you want, a lot of us, we go, oh, it must be crabgrass. So it is, in fact, not crabgrass. Crabgrass uh, is the catch-all term That's the catch-all term, just like everything that you see that's a broadleaf weed tends to be a dandelion. Right. All right? Now, the other thing that's going to happen is a lot of times when the weeds are flowering is when you're going to notice them. And uh, some of them that put on a great show in the springtime, other than dandelion, of course, would be wild violet and creeping charlie. And uh, a lot of times those will get put into a category we call difficult to control. And uh, there is an active ingredient that actually has uh, more uh, effectiveness on those difficult to control weeds. And uh, that active ingredient is triclopyr, which we mentioned earlier for uh, poison ivy. But it also is an important ingredient if you're going to be going after things like uh, ground ivy or creeping charlie, which is uh, two common names for that, or wild violet. So Trey, what I thought we could do is just walk around a little bit and look at some of the weeds that are growing in this area and see how would we make a decision on what product we might choose or how we uh, proceed with getting rid of those weeds. Oh, that sounds wonderful. I couldn't think of a better idea. So over here, you know, the, the most famous broadleaf weed is dandelion. And on this nice sunny day uh, in, the, in the springtime, the dandelion's already flowering. It's come uh, you, out. You recognize it because it has sort of that head of lettuce on top with the, with the lobed leaves coming around there. And of course, this very characteristic uh, dandelion, which my children seem to enjoy uh, blowing all over the place when it turns to a puffball. And uh, so uh, dandelion, pretty typical, a lot what we'd expect. Um, it's kind of, as you notice all through here, we see a lot of white clover. Uh, white clover is a, is a three leaf weed that a lot of times has a little crescent moon shaped watermark uh, going around the, the, the leaflets here. And clover is an interesting weed in that it actually indicates to us that uh, this area probably does not get uh, fertilized with uh, a whole lot of nitrogen. Right. Uh, Ron, I would argue that, that a yard full of weeds always tells a story. It, absolutely, absolutely. Whether it means that we're mowing correctly or that we're fertilizing correctly or incorrectly or that we're watering correctly or incorrectly. So, you know, I, people come to me oftentimes and they say that have a yard full of weeds and they say, I have a weed problem. And after about two minutes of talking to them, I say, no, what you have is a mowing problem. You're mowing incorrectly or watering incorrectly. So the weeds are oftentimes an effect mm -hmm. of poor maintenance practices, not the cause. Well, some of the best examples of that are the ones that we consider to be difficult to control. So you think again, wild violet, right. ground ivy, creeping speedwell. Uh, these are all weeds that will tolerate a low mowing height. Uh, they'll tolerate uh, some medium to heavy shade. They'll tolerate a little bit of wet feet, which sure. means that our soil is staying too wet. Right. And they, 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 can, they can tolerate uh, a variety of nitrogen. So if you're not fertilizing to fertilizing a lot, they're pretty tolerant to a wide variety. And they're very tolerant of our most common broadleaf selective herbicides. And so they've uh, sort of over 40 or 50 years, we've uh, uh, selected for these weeds that are very, very well adapted to our backyards. Right. Very well said. Now, if you, if you come over here, you'll see a patch over there. I was talking earlier about 
um, some where people see crabgrass in the springtime, and that's an excellent example of the tall fescue of, of tall fescue patch coming in there. Again, this is not the this is not the uh, the, the turf type, uh, but this is a wild type tall fescue. has a wider leaf blade. Uh, it's kind of rough. Uh, a lot of I don't know. My friends can like make this whistle. I don't know. Yeah, how to but do at that, the same but, time, uh, what you're going to get, we're going to constantly get is phone calls that people saying that. Um, the pre-emergence didn't work, that they've got a yard right. full of crabgrass. And it's, this is what we're talking about. Yep, this is not crabgrass. You'll see the tall fescue. Um, orchard grass would look that way. Quack grass would also look that way. And uh, so it's pretty typical in this place as we see uh, clover coming in, dandelion coming in. Uh, there's some broadleaf plantain. Uh, earlier you picked up a little bit of, uh, of uh, ground ivy as well. And so this would be uh, certainly a candidate if you wanted to go after it that way, where a broadleaf selective herbicide is going to be very effective. We've talked about the broadleaf weed, right? But we need to get back to that annual weed that sure. is the, you know, the the mother of that's all. That's right. And that's the crabgrass. Crabgrass, plant. absolutely. And uh, you know, crabgrass too tells us a story because when we see crabgrass, we think about things like uh, increased soil temperatures in the springtime. And so that could occur in areas where maybe you had grub feeding last right, fall. Right. Uh, could Any, it, anything bare. Anything, anything bare, bare. Any sort soil. of disturbance, areas near your sidewalk, between the sidewalk and the curb. So when we see that in the summertime, uh, we think, okay, uh, maybe you want to take care of that. And if you do, you're going to again have to, now you're looking at a post emergence uh, herbicide. You want to do selective, right? So we don't kill the other grass. So this is interesting. Now we want to select for one grass but not kill the other grasses. So now we're really, we're really kind of cutting a fine slice here. But uh, the cool thing about it is there's some products that'll do that. And you mentioned one earlier, which is quinclorac. Right. And that's going to be the one that you're going to see in almost all of the consumer products. It's going to be quinclorac. And that is post-emergence selective for annual grasses. Okay, so we're really making a fine cut here. Just taking out those annual grasses and leaving the rest of your lawn. The ingredient that you're looking for mm -hmm. in these herbicides is quinclorac. Right, for, for crabgrass post-emergence. Right. And, but in order to apply any of these products, you need a way to get them out. And so I'd like to show you a couple ways that that can, that can be done. Outstanding. Um, the most, the most uh, uh, convenient way is to have the companies mix it up for you. And that's something we call RTU, or ready to use. Exactly. And so any of these products that have a trigger on them, we consider that to be RTU, ready to use. This is already mixed with the water. So you can go out, you're going to spray that, and when we spray that, all we want to do is get the surface of the leaves wet. Don't okay? put on too much. You put on too much, it's just wasting the product. So we just want to spray to wet, coat the leaves, move on, all right? And a product like this yep. is, a good, is a good investment if you have a, a weeds in your yard that 5%, not a lot of them. If you've got a yard full of weeds, in other words, you're just getting started on your weed problem, then you're going to probably need to go after something that's a little bit more uh, inclusive, like a larger sprayer. Yeah, and so there's two ways to do that. Uh, the next step from an RTU is an RTS, which is ready to spray. And so this is actually going to hook up to your hose, and it has a siphon tube in it that's going to siphon the concentrated product at a given rate as your water goes through with your, with your garden hose. And this is the same kind of thing. Again, the tendency here with any of these products is to apply too much product. Just you wasting just money. Need, you're just wasting money. You just need to spray to wet. So I'm going to put that in, and I'm going to go around. Now, there is a cost to convenience. All right, these products on a on an area basis cost much more, or they're much more expensive than if you use a concentrated product in a in a larger sprayer. So uh, as as earlier we were saying right. with a concentrate, okay, we're going to take that concentrate and we're going to use something like a like a pump sprayer that's going to give us a larger volume. We're going to be able to put maybe two or three gallons in here. Again, the instructions are going to be on the on the label of the herbicide, and uh, this uses compressed air that you do with the with the hand pump here and you can go around and this can spray a larger area and then you've probably seen like the lawn care companies where they even have larger equipment for doing acres and acres. So that kind of covers the herbicide options of the way that we might go, go for this. Uh, there are also some uh, non-herbicide or organic things that we could consider. Uh, one is good old-fashioned elbow grease. As earlier I was showing you, right. you know, I, uh, I have this example here of, uh, you know, a lot of people just yank out the weed and we'll pull it out. Let me right? hold that. I know okay. you, I know you, you might you need love to use two hands. I know, it. Okay? I know you love that. All right. So you just want to yank out this weed and you think, all right, I've taken care of it. And what you're not addressing is this very robust storage system. And you come back a few weeks later, there's going to be another weed in that same spot. So if you're going to use uh, hand pulling, you really need to get all of it. And uh, a little, uh, 
little weed fork like this. Right. Um, this is how I dug this out. This is also how I pulled out your bull thistle earlier. And uh, and this this is uh, can be very effective. You kind of work your way around. But the most important thing there is is that you're getting the whole plant I'm, I'm out. loosening the whole thing like a tooth. You know. If I of, just cut this off, what's going to happen? Absolutely, we'll have another plant generating from this from that tap root. And that's an, that's the most the most important take home message to remember is. If you want to dig these out by hand, mm -hmm. dig out the whole plant. There's now, some the other idea things. there is just to have a continued effort. Yep, it, it's the, the will of the weed to come in typically outlasts the will of the homeowner to keep it out. That's right. right. And uh, so here is uh, That's another. A it, it is, it is. Uh, and and uh, this is another, another product so you don't have to bend over as much. You were kind of complaining about that. And uh, so that gives you the ability to put that in. The idea is that these, when you push down on that, that those teeth are going to clamp around that and pull that out. Uh, my feeling is you're probably going to leave some portion of that behind, uh, but on other sorts of weeds that aren't quite as robust as dandelion, that could be very effective and save your back. I think we should talk a little bit about the organic options. And I know that there are a lot of people that are always asking us, that might be our most popular question, is, is there something that I can use besides herbicides? Now, I think two things when people ask me about using organic options. First thing I think of is, yes, there's a few products, but at the same time, I also think that if we're going to use these products, you're going to have to be even more vigilant with things like mowing correctly, watering correctly, and fertilizing correctly. Because these products, while they can take the weeds out, they're still never going to be as effective as herbicides, or at least they aren't yet. Yeah, well, the key thing to remember here, the, the key word is burn, okay? And these types of products are going to burn the vegetation. Typically, we're also going to see them as either <clears throat> uh, non-selective or uh, non-selective up or selective up to a point. But if you put too much on, you start to get some burn on the grass. So, for example, if you're going to do something like that and you get that four to six weeks of suppression, but yet all you keep doing is scalping your grass down, you can expect this ground ivy to come back. So if I could apply the borax, this is an example, if I could apply the borax, then raise my mowing height up a couple of inches, then all of a sudden now I'm going to encourage the grass and discourage the ground up. Yeah, absolutely. And so it, it really partners together. I'd say some of the main challenges to organic approach is that we say we want organic, but we want sort of conventional results. So if you could, again, if you can have that longer term view of improving the overall health and vigor of your lawn, you're going to be a lot more successful with these sorts of approaches. <clears throat> so let's, how about vinegar? Now I know that I've used this vinegar in the home or in my home, uh, for example, to burn out plants in places like the sidewalk and in the driveway. So mm -hmm. this would be in the non-selective type of situation, but it will certainly take those, burn those plants out. You can put this in at about four or five ounces per gallon. That will be a uh, enough of a ratio to get the job done. And it's just going to burn, it's just going to burn it down again. Right. And then you'll oftentimes hear us talk about using some Dawn uh, for taking out moss. And uh, one of the reasons is is because of the bacteria side that's in the in yep. the Dawn and it will take out the uh, the moss in your in your yard. But oftentimes what you're gonna see is the moss is in a shady area. Right. The moss is in a wet area. So if you don't get rid of the shade and you don't get rid of the wetness where grass can actually start growing, the moss will just come right back. So you can continue to use the Don, but you need to change the environment. That's the thing that you have to remember is change your environment. And that's five ounces of Dawn and three gallons of water. And you want to add the water first or you just have a big frothy mess. You are amazing. Yeah, I learned that the hard way actually. <laughs> this is a combination of this corn gluten product which has a fair amount of nitrogen content. Right. Uh, but then also uh, has uh, what I would characterize as a, as a weak pre-emergence herbicide. All right, and uh, again, that longer term view is going to be effective with a product like this. It's a, a byproduct of corn, uh, of corn processing. And uh, this corn gluten meal then can be used in your lawn as a fertilizer. And over a number of years, probably three seasons, you'll start to see an improvement in, uh, from the fertilizer aspect, but also a buildup of that pre-emergence aspect, which then will kind of come back and you'll see, start to see less dandelions, less clover, uh, less crabgrass. So 
with the corn gluten meal, I guess the question again becomes timing, and the timing right. would be for any type of pre-emergence. Right, we're going to consider this just like we consider sort of the conventional synthetic pre-emergence herbicides. Right. So we're going to apply this in the spring before the crabgrass has emerged. Uh, a flowering indicator we could use uh, in many cases can be when the forsythia is at full bloom. The forsythia is bright yellow. The forsythia is bright yellow. When that's at full bloom is also, as we looked earlier, when those temperatures are going to be sort of in the mid-50s. Now the crabgrass isn't going to germinate until we get hit into, into right. the 60s. So we want to have that pre-emergence place. So that would work for, for corn gluten meal. It would also work for other ones. Now you could come back if you're using this as your fertilizer. You might make a second application of this in the year and that's going to just help to build up that fertilizer and have the grass growing in, yep. uh, but also then uh, the pre-emergence barrier as well. So, so that up, would be pre-emergence. Pick, up, pick yeah. up that uh, Creeping Charlie again, okay. because there's the flowers on the on the ground, Ivy. Absolutely. And that reminds me of the borax, because I don't think I pointed out that we want to probably use about an ounce of this borax to about a, a 1.25 gallons. Okay. But the yep. flowers are still the important indicator. They, they are. The, they're so the indicator for uh, our triclopyr that we would use in the springtime. Or the and borax. They're also the indicator for the borax. Absolutely. And so uh, our that second best timing is when this square leaf smells like mint, purple flowers. When that's happening, that's our go time for for that borax. That you're going to get the best burn down on that. I'm wondering if we might have some questions. I've been told we have some questions. Oh, thank you, Missy. Look at this. Now, Ron, yeah. you stand over there because you get the quiz. Okay. Um, are wild violets a weed and will they spread? <laughs> I have them, I have a patch of them growing in my lawn. All right. Well, you get to determine if wild violets are a weed or not, okay? So uh, they're actually uh, quite attractive when they flower. Uh, my kids bring them to me uh, a lot of time. Uh, they spread by, a uh, by creeping roots. So they have a really fibrous root system, and then on that root system, it can actually put up other, other plants eventually. So it doesn't, uh, doesn't creep very quickly, but it can, it can spread. Is it possible to truly have a weed-free lawn? I think... Uh, one of our best examples of this is where we look at using the right mowing height, setting that push mower on its highest setting, welding it there, don't change it, okay? We're uh, fertilizing uh, so that the grass has what it needs, and then we come in there and we remove those broadleaf weeds, and we have examples now where I can show you five years later, we still have one or two percent dandelion, one or two percent uh, clover, uh, because we've properly partnered uh, the herbicide, with the uh, fertilization and the mowing and, and those things that we're doing and getting a long-term effect. And so you can do things in an efficient way that's gonna make your efforts last a, a long time. Well, that's about all the time we have for questions, but we've really enjoyed being with you today and we still wanna hear from you. So call us at one yard 866 yardtips or call our Yard Smarts hotline, or email us by going to yardsmarts.com. We've really enjoyed being with you. Myself, I'm Trey Rogers. I'm your yard doctor. This is Ron Calhoun. In the meantime, I'm going to go dig some more weeds. He's amazing. <laughs>